Yeah, we're going to talk about trust a little bit more today. Um, we have uh, we have people in our church that are familiar with these. We have a number of law enforcement and agents, and and uh, uh, had one of them loan me loan me this this morning. I put one of these on just to you know for fun. I've never had these on for real, thank God. And uh, I hope I hope you have never had them on for real, uh, because what they do is they they work. And I put I put one of them on, and and I have the key, and I couldn't get it open with the key, but that doesn't tell you so much about these as it does about this. But anyway, I had a uh, thank God we had a former uh, uh, highway patrolman in our church who came over and took the key from me and released me. Why are we talking about handcuffs? There's things that that, that bind us, and these are certainly something that will restrict you and when they put these on especially if your hands are behind your back yeah you're uh, you're pretty much toast these things will will keep you from going and doing what you want to do in life and uh, the, the the devil has uh, a number of handcuffs that he uses I know some people don't believe in the devil and that's right that, that's your that's your right to do so uh, you don't you don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in the devil. I had a I did a wedding the other night and uh, actually uh, Kristen Kristen Price Kristen Costa got married uh, and uh, I heard that there was a, an atheist in the crowd who afterwards said actually that you know that was good you know and uh, and uh, so uh, you know I, I told I told my friend I said you should have told him you know you you may not believe in God but he sure believes in you. You know, and uh, people don't always believe in God. Some people don't believe in a devil. I do. I believe in a real devil. And uh, I believe that the devil is the God of this age. Uh, according to, that did that this morning. I don't know what it is. It's not me. I didn't do that. But it's uh, Second, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And, and it says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of them who do not believe. So that they can't see the light of the glorious gospel. That if if the blinders could be removed, that people could then understand God. Well, because most of us in this room are born again Christians, the blinders have been removed. But not all of the binds. The binders, the things that bind us, have been removed. And these are the things that keep us from trusting in God. We're going to talk about three of them today. Three things that keep us from trusting in God. We all want to trust in God, I really think that we all want to trust in God with every fat, every facet of our life. I, I want to trust in God with my finances because, because blessed is the man who trusts in, in, in the Lord. Well, I want to be blessed. I want the blessings of God on me. I want the blessings of God on my finance. Can you say an amen to that? Amen. Yeah. I want the blessings of God on my physical body, on my health. Amen? amen. I want the blessings of God on my marriage. Amen. Or if you're single, in your search for a marriage partner. Or if you're not searching and you're just happy single, I want God to bless your singleness and give you good friends and support system. I want God to bless my family. I want God to bless my sons and to bless my daughter-in-law and to bless my grandson and my... Well, we're, right now we're calling him Cletus because... Uh, uh, Cletus the fetus. Because... Um, my daughter-in-law is pregnant again. And so we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, so we just affectionately call him Cletus the fetus. So we'll know soon enough. But I want God to bless her pregnancy. I want God to bless. I want God's blessing on every, every aspect of my life. But there's things that I fall into that restrict me, that handcuff me from trusting in God with things. And one of them is that I just become too earthbound. I just get, just, this world, and all that goes on in this world, and all the pressures, and all the demands of this world, could sometimes get me from, keep me from following God. Colossians 3, 2 says this, set your minds on things above. I think of my mind sometimes as wet concrete. You know what, you know what wet concrete needs? Forms. Forms are what set the concrete where it needs to be. If you just pour concrete out with no forms, it's just going to look like a big gray poop. It's just going to go. 
But if you build forms, if you set boundaries that are sturdy and strong, you can pour that concrete in and it will set according to that form. Our minds are like concrete. But if we don't have boundaries, if we don't have things, forms that set our thoughts on things above, they'll just kind of flow all over the place. What are the forms for me? Every morning of my life, one of the primary forms of my life that sets my mind like concrete is God's Word. But I don't just carry a Bible around. I don't just, well, God's Word is going to, it's good, this is going to work. No, I, I have to, I have to read it. And I, I have to, I have to think about it. I have to meditate on it. And then I pray. Prayer helps set. It's one of the forms that helps set my life. Church attendance. Not that going to church saves me, but what it does is it connects me with God. It's like one of the forms that helps set my mind on things above rather than on earthly things. And then fellowship with other Christians is a form. Now listen, I, I spend time with non-believers. I think it's essential that we spend time with non-believers. How else will they know unless Christians are out there? We have to be the light and the truth. And we have to be the love of God to people that don't know Him. But listen, I can't just spend all my time with people that don't know Jesus. Otherwise, it's going to be hard for me to follow God. I need to be around men and women who love God and want to talk about the Lord and want to support and, and, and help me and pray with me. And, and, you know, I have a network of guys in this church and I have a network of guys outside this church that pastor other churches. And there's three or four of them and we call each other. We call each other weekly just to say, how are you, man? I don't care about how your church is. How are you doing? What's going on in your heart? They're like my squad. They're like my crew. And, and, and I need these people, right? We, these are the forms that help set us. But man, we can get caught up in the worldly things. When Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower and how the sower goes out and he throws the seeds and he sows some and throws some on, on the hard soil and the birds come and they eat it up and then he throws some on the, on the uh, shallow soil and when, the, when, when they grow up, they, 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 they die out quick because there's no root. And then he throws, some of it was thrown in the soil with all the weeds and the weeds come up and choked everything out and then some were thrown on good soil and it grew a harvest. And the disciples asked him a little bit later, what, what's the definition of that? And when Jesus is talking about the soil and all the weeds and stuff, Here's what he said the weeds were. The, the weeds were the worries of this life. The deceitfulness of wealth. Thinking that money's going to save you. Money's going to spare you. Money's going to make what you need and make it happen for you. And so what you do is you put in more time and more time and more time and more time at the office. When all of us are on our deathbed, none of us are going to be laying there going, I wish I'd have spent more time in the office. I wish I'd have just got that one more deal. All of our regrets are going to be about people and God. That, that's what our regrets are going to be over. That we didn't spend more time with God. That we didn't spend more time with our loved ones. It won't be about money. You won't be laying there going, I, I don't know what this is, folks. I really apologize. I know it's annoying. It's annoying me. Let's just quit. Let's not quit. We won't be laying there on our deathbed going, oh, if I could have just got that new house. Going to be worried about what... Uh, is any of the staff around? Let me, let me turn this.
person will like us. And so that just robs us of our time and our energies in our life. You said you need man's approval. Am I on now, David? It, this, is the, this is the microphone that uh, Joni uses. Okay, thank you. So people falsely believe that, that if I want to have real life, I've got to, I've got to live it to the full. And so people, and, and especially in this day and age, people are, they're going everywhere all the time. How, how is a person supposed to have a walk with Jesus if they're, if they're racing through life, constantly going here and there and then here, and then we got to go there, and then we got to do this, and then we got to do that, and we have to do this, and this person wants us to do that. And the next thing you know, you're so caught up in life. What, what happened to my walk with Jesus? Where's the Lord? I don't feel the presence of the Lord. Well, connect a few dots. What's what are the forms? What are the what, what have you set in your life as boundaries and 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 forms that are that are holding your mind on things of God? And then and I'm guilty of this. I get in my car. I've got all my presets and my radio, and I'm listening to this channel. I don't like that song. I go to the next one. I mean, I've got all these channels. You're, we've got so many channels on our XM radio or whatever it is, and we got so many television channels, hundreds of channels on the TV, and it's just it's just constant. There's something going on all the time. We think this is life, living it to the full. But I'm going to tell you, true fulfillment in life is it found in knowing is knowing and by knowing the creator of life he's the author of life and when you spend time with him you're going to be infused with life have you ever spent time with people that love jesus that knew jesus and you maybe had a meal with them and you just walked away and you felt so good what that is is god was present where two or more gathered together he's there in your midst and you walk away feeling refreshed you walk away feeling stronger than ever and it's it's because of who God is and, and that he's the author of life and he fills us with life when we're with him. Hebrews chapter 4 says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. And so when I read the word in the morning, I am reading life into my heart. I'm reading life into my mind. And so these are the forms that set me, that keep me trusting in God and not distracted by all the stuff that's going on in the world. Because all these other things, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. But man, if your forms are weak, if your forms aren't solid, your mind, like concrete, is just going to start to ooze and it's going to start to drift, and then there's going to be nothing really that's solid. It's just, it's just what happens. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're a failure. What it means is that you have failed to set your forms, the things that hold you fast. That's what we need. Because the thief comes only. This is his only, the only thing he comes to do is to steal you. And steal from you. He wants to steal your time. He wants to steal your attention. He wants to steal you away so that he can kill your faith and destroy your future. That's his goal. He wants to steal you away from the things of God and get you pursuing everything else in life, thinking this will do it, this will do it, this will make me happy. I'll go here, we'll do this, we'll do that. We'll go over here, we'll buy this, we'll get that. And then we'll be happy. And he steals your time from God, which kills your faith and destroys your future. But Jesus came that you'd have life. That's eternal life. And life more abundantly. That's the, the life that you need, that you really want. But trust in God is what does that. It's hard to trust God too, not just when we're earthbound, but when we're out of bounds. When we're out of bounds. Yesterday I was watching uh, college football, and uh, Notre Dame is playing Ball State. Now they they, they say that the, the the first part of the college football season is like the cupcake schedule, and they you know teams like Alabama will play you know Moorhead State, who has absolutely no chance of beating Alabama, and Alabama will win seventy-one to nothing or something like that. It's called the cupcake schedule. It's like their preseason. Well, Notre Dame, who's 
top ranked, one of the top ranked teams in the in the college football, is playing Ball State from Muncie, Indiana. Little school, okay, Ball State. And uh, they were saying last year at Ball State's football games, they had 57,000 people in attendance the whole year. The whole year. All their home games added up 57,000 people. They were playing in a stadium yesterday at Notre Dame that had 77,000 people at one game. So that just gives you a reference. So Ball State's doing their best. They're trying their hardest. And it's a fairly close game at the, at the beginning. And, and, and Ball State's, you know, like third and eight or whatever. And their receiver races downfield, puts a move on the, on the Notre Dame defensive back, and he makes a spectacular play on about the three-yard line, catches this ball. It was a great play. Comes down with it. He's got it. And, and they're calling it back. And I'm like, what? I watched the play there. He, there was no offensive pass interference. There was no defensive pass interference. Why are they calling a, 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 a foul here? Why did they throw a flag? It was a great play. He stepped out of bounds on his way down. When the wide receiver was running down the sideline, he put the move on the, the defensive back, and, he, and his foot stepped out of bounds. Well, once you step out of bounds, you're now out of bounds. You're, you're ineligible to catch a ball. You're ineligible. That happens to us sometimes. We're running in this life. We're, we're, we're believing in God. We're trusting in Him. And then, and then we take this attitude or, 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 or we do these things. And the next thing you know, we're out of bounds. And it kind of makes us ineligible for the blessings of God. It's not, not that God is going to kick you off the team. That, that, that player for Ball State, he, nobody kicked him off the team. He's not going to be disciplined. He's not going to have to run laps after, after, after the game. He, he's not going to be benched. The coach wasn't even all that upset. It's just it happens sometimes. One of the most famous out-of-bounds plays is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. When the, <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent tricked and deceived Eve into wanting to take a bite of the, 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 the fruit from the tree that they were not supposed to, and they violated God's orders, God's commands. And they sinned, and when they sinned, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. Because many believe at that point that the, the glory of God was covering them, and when they sinned, the glory of God departed, because God cannot dwell with sin. And when the glory of God, it's like, it's like the God fog lifted, and they went, huh! and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I'm sure glad that God also made cotton. I'm so glad God made polyester. <laughs> How would we have got through the 70s? But I'm glad we don't cover ourselves with fig leaves, right? Because I wouldn't go out of the house. But they tried to hide. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Out of bounds. They stepped out of bounds. And they tried to hide from the coach. And they didn't need to. You know what's interesting is <laughs> Adam knew God probably better than any human being on planet earth God formed Adam from the from the from the dust in Genesis chapter 2 and then he stooped down and he breathed his breath into into Adam's nostrils and the bible says and Adam became a living being not just alive he became a living being do you know that when Adam's eyes opened the first thing he saw was God there's nobody that has known God like Adam knew God. And Adam tried to hide from God. What does that tell you about us? He tried to hide from God, knowing that he can't hide from God. But so many people, because of their sin, what they've done in the past, and their sinfulness, what they're doing right now. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we all have it done. But then there's sometimes that even though we know the Lord and we love the Lord and we want to serve the Lord, we're still a, we're still a doing. I am a done, and sometimes I'm a doing. And it's not what I should be. And so 
it causes us to, to, to try and hide from God because of our shame. We're sh- we should know better, right? Sometimes I, I do something, I should know better. My goodness, I read the Bible all the time. and Not all the time. I read the Bible every morning. I read the Bible. I know the Word of God. I know the Lord. I know what He wants. I know His commands. And I still do stuff I shouldn't. And I'm, I'm doing it. And so it's like, God, you must be so upset with me. I mean, I know that's wrong, but I did it anyway. I thought that thought anyway. I said those words anyway. What's wrong with me? Oh, then I go to Paul who said, the thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing, and the thing that I want to do, I find myself unable to do. Who's going to save this wretched man that I am? Thanks be to God. Therefore, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God forgives. God forgives. We think that when we, when we do or have done, that God's so upset with us that he wants to kick us out of his family. But playing hide-and-seek with the all-knowing one, it, it never works. It's a losing proposition. God knows right now where you are. God knows everything about you right now. God knows everything you've done. He's no, he's no, he knows everything that you've thought. He knows every word you've spoken. He knows everything you're going to say. He knows every thought you're going to think. And he loves us anyway. <laughs> Now that right there should cause us all to worship. That God knows me so well and loves me anyway. Because let me tell you, if if somebody knew everything about me, they would run from me. There was a a comedian years ago, and uh, he he said, you know, women try and, and figure out what men are thinking. And he said, women, if you knew what men were thinking, you would never stop slapping us. But, uh, you know, God knows everything, and he still loves us. Still loves us. And like Adam and Eve, we'll find that there just aren't leaves big enough or effective enough to cover our our sin, our nakedness. So what are we going to do? Ignore it? No, that'll bind us up. That'll keep us from trusting. We go to the coach. And we say, I stepped out of bounds again. And and I want you to forgive me. And I want to do better. Will you help me? And you know what your coach is going to tell you in heaven? I forgive you. Let's get back in the game. Let's get back in there. Let's go. I'm with you. That's why I came. That's why I died on the cross. It's because... I knew you were going to step out of bounds. I knew you get clumsy. I knew that you get distracted. I knew that you you sometimes see the line and you try to fake somebody out and you step out. I know that about you. But I love you anyway and I forgive you. And I want you to get going back in the game and don't let this keep you from being who I've called you to be. Hiding from God has never been an answer. So I've just learned over the years that when I sin, my, my done and my doing, is that I just, I just say, hey, God, can we have a talk? And you know what? That's exactly what God wants to do. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, I'll make them white as wool. All God wants to do is sit and talk to you about it. Not judge you, not, not throw the book at you. Not destroy you, but to, to, to talk about it. And I, I think the more we talk to the Lord about our sin, the more we realize, you know what, God, your way is better than my way. And I'll do better to listen to you and stay in bounds. Then the catch is valid. If that guy from Ball State hadn't have stepped out of bounds, that catch would have been good. They'd have been on the two or three yard line, maybe scored a touchdown, tightened the game up against Notre Dame. Jeremiah 5.29, I should have given you, let me give you a warning. This is a hard scripture warning. Warning, warning, this scripture is, is not an easy one, okay? Are you ready? So you've been warned. Jeremiah 5.25, your wrongdoings have keep, kept these away from you. 
kept these away. What? Kept what away? The blessings of God. Now, is that because God's mad at you and he doesn't like you? No. No. Is it, if you're out of bounds, you can't catch the ball. That's all that means. You're not an eligible player if you're stepping out. Your wrongdoings have kept the blessing away from you. Your sins have deprived you of good. And that's not what God wants. Because God is good all the time. And He wants to bring so much good to your life and my life. We have to trust Him. The final thing that keeps us from trusting in God, and this is as big a restrictor, a set of handcuffs as, as ever. And that's when we're fear bound. There's just so many people that are they're so bound by fear, they can't they can't move. They can't think. They're just they're afraid to make another mistake and get clobbered by somebody. And it's just got them it's got them bound and wound so tight. And then you know, you know what comes from fear is anger. Anger starts flowing out of fear. First John 4, 18. These are the words of John. There's no fear in love. My wife, she loves me. She just loves me. I know, right? You think, she's crazy. But she does. She really loves me. Now, what's great about that is I don't have any fear around her. I, I never I never worry or wonder or live in any fear over what she says about me to others. She loves me. My name is safe on her lips. She doesn't, to my knowledge, she's never said anything bad about me to anyone. I know, right? I know some of you think she needs her eyes checked. <laughs> she's never, that I know of, never said anything bad about me to anyone. I'll tell you this, too. I've never said anything bad about my wife to anyone. Never. Never said a, 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 a bad word. I've never, I've never had a, a time when I was getting counseling and, and said bad things about my wife or a group of guys sitting around, they're all talking about how bad their wives are and this and that. I, you'll never hear me partake in that. I just don't. Never have. But I know this about her. If there's a bunch of women sitting around and they start griping about their husbands, she usually just gets up and leaves. You want to engage in that kind of misery, the one person that would say, I do to you, and you're going to badmouth them to people? Forever. They said, I do to you forever. I'm safe with my wife. I have no fear around her, and she has no fear around me. She's safe with me because we love each other. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect, but we love each other. I know that she has no intention of harming me in any way to anyone at any time. And, and the same is true of me to her. Well, how much more so does God love you? How safe is your name on his lips? How safe are you in his presence? You see, when we understand how much He loves us, we don't, we're not living in fear of Him. Yeah. Do we sin? Yeah. God, you, you, you were right there when I sinned. You saw what I did. And I, uh, God, I, I don't know what to tell you other than I love you and I'm sorry. And I need you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive me. There's not much else I can say after that. Lord, you know what an idiot I am. You made me. I'm not saying this is your fault, but you do know me. And that's biblical. Psalms 103, David says, God knows that we're just dust. He formed us. So, and I'm not excusing sin, but listen, the more I understand the love and forgiveness of God, it just, just being honest with him about who I am and what I've done, and not living in fear of him, but living in awe of his goodness towards me and his grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works. So that no man can boast. 
Perfect love drives out fear. If I'm living, if I have fears of this level, that means that the understanding I have of God's love for me is way down there. But as God's love for me, as I start understanding how much He loves me, as that starts to rise, the higher it rises, the lower fear goes. The one who fears and is living in fears doesn't understand God's love. That's really what John's saying there. You really just don't understand God's love. Because if you do, you wouldn't be afraid. Fear can grip a person's life and paralyze them. Like a set of handcuffs. It can paralyze you. And then the person becomes so overwrought with the fears that they can't settle their mind. So how can they trust in God when these fears are causing them to, to think about all the bad things that are going to happen down the road because of, oh, and what if this, and then what if that, and then what if this, and, and, then, and then the news will come on and say, and we haven't even had the big earthquake yet. Oh, no, you think of that, and, and oh, man, this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and this is coming, and that's coming, and man, it's going to, if 2019 comes, it, it'll just be luck if we're even alive here at all then. And it, people can get so wrapped up in that and so fearful that their minds just start to race. And then, and, and their, the, the, then their heart is, the, the heart starts beating more and more and more, and they become so panic stricken. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't God love me? Does God love me? What's the very worst thing that can happen to you? You die which is the very best thing that will ever happen to you is you'll be like Adam and your eyes are going to open and you're going to see God if you've given your heart to Jesus Adam opened his eyes and he he saw God and when you die my dad died in July and the moment that he passed and his heart stopped beating and he passed he opened his eyes and saw the Lord. I, I want that. I'm in. So, no matter what happens to me, what, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? The fear will keep us from trusting in God. But it's in trusting in God that the fears start to go. So it's this catch-22. The more you fear, the less you trust. But the more you trust, the less you fear. So it's almost like, you know what, oh, I, I think I got it. You know what it is? It's a choice. It's a choice. I think sometimes I choose to be fearful when I could choose to trust. As Peter walked on the water, get that. Get that. Who's walked on the water? Anybody? Because we want to watch. Jesus walked on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they first thought it was a ghost and they were terrified. But then Peter realized it was Jesus and said, Hey, hey, Jesus, it's me, Peter. Hey, you know me. He says, Hey, can I come out to you? And Jesus says, Yeah, come on. All of the disciples could have followed. They all could have got out. And they could have had a little party on the, on the water. Peter got out and started to walk on the water. But, but, when he saw the wind and the waves, he became afraid. Lost his faith and sank. Lost his faith in God. Okay. He sees Jesus. He speaks to Jesus. Jesus says, come on. He gets out of the boat. He starts walking to Jesus. And all of a sudden, he sees the wind and the waves. What happened to his eyes? They got diverted. They got distracted. He took his eyes off Jesus, got distracted. We take our eyes off Jesus, we get distracted. We sink. Faith, trust, starts going. 
God wants us to trust him. Just trust me. And he says to Peter, he says, oh, Peter, man, you were, it's almost like Jesus said, you were doing so good, dude. What happened? What happened to you? Man, you were walking along. And he's like, ah, Jesus, I'm saying it. Jesus came and grabbed him, threw him in the boat. You're strong too, Jesus. See, when we're fearful, I, I think that's, I, I believe and I know that that story is real. But I think it's also something we can glean today. There's a transferable concept here. And that's that when we become fearful, we don't put our trust in Jesus. Because you can't. They're opposite. Faith and fear are opposite. And we sink as well. I don't want you to sink. You don't want to sink. You're... you're your spouse doesn't want you to sink. God doesn't want you to sink. He wants you to party on on the water with him. Let's have some fun. Let's have some fun in this life. Walk with me. That's what Jesus wants. Walk with me. I've come to give you life, but life more abundantly. That means I want to have a good time with you. Let's play the game. Stop stepping out of bounds and worrying about what I'm going to do to you. Just let me love you. And trust me. Because I haven't given you a spirit of fear. That's what God would say to you. That doesn't come from me. That spirit of fear, it comes from the devil. That spirit of fear, it comes from our parents. That spirit of fear, it comes from the news media. That spirit of fear, it comes from the government. The spirit of fear, it can come from our teachers and friends and people that supposedly love us. That spirit of fear comes from other places, but it does not come from God. He doesn't operate in fear. He operates in power. He operates in love. He operates in soundness. He does not operate in fear. He doesn't need to. Let's bow our heads. Some of you have been out of bounds, and you've let that keep you from God. And God is not mad at you, but he's mad that that, that sin is keeping you from him. That's what he's mad about. He's so mad at sin, he went and died for it. He had to die for it to kill it because he hated sin so much. He wanted to kill it. And he hates what sin is doing to you. He hates how it's keeping you from him. It's keeping you off the field. You can't catch any balls when you're off the field. You're ineligible. What he wants you to do is just talk to him, get it right, ask him to forgive you, and get back on the field. Get back out there. I choose not to live in fear, Lord. I choose to live in trust and faith in you. And I choose when I sin to come to you and ask you to forgive me. I choose to do that. And I ask you to help me so I don't step out of bounds. Teach me to run right routes, the correct routes. And then, Lord, I want to set my mind. I want the forms there. The Word, your Word is a form that sets my mind. Prayer is a form that sets, worship sets my mind. Fellowship with other Christians, coming to church, it all sets me every week, every day, so that my mind doesn't just wander and go all over the place. You keep me. Thank you, Father. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Chad, one of the staff pastors here at the Foothills Church. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our channel. Also, you can donate with this link down in the bottom or go to our website, thefoothillschurch.org.